Section 14 of The Major Symptoms of Hysteria This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Major Symptoms of Hysteria by Pierre Janet Lecture 14 The Hysterical Stigmata The Retraction of the Field of Consciousness The Common Stigmata Other proper hysterical stigmata Absent-mindedness the contraction of voluntary movements, subconsciousness, transfers and equivalences, alternation, the elementary phenomena of consciousness, personal perception, conscious synthesis, the field of consciousness, its variations, the retraction of the field of consciousness, the common stigmata, the feelings of incompleteness, the need of excitation, the need of attracting attention, lapses of the mental functions, the weakness of attention, emotional disturbances, troubles of the will, the incapacity of beginning or of stopping, the lowering of the mental level. The role played by suggestion in hysteria is beginning to be known, and I shall no longer raise too many protestations by presenting to you suggestion as a hysterical stigma. But I think it is well to go farther. We should not explain the whole of this so complex disease by this single phenomenon. For the present, I confine myself to remarking that, in the mental dispositions of these patients, there are to be found other facts of at least equal importance. These other fundamental phenomena are also stigmata to my mind. Only I propose to you to divide them into two classes. Among these stigmata, some deserve to be called proper. They have the same properties as suggestion itself. They are phenomena that exist in hysteria, but scarcely exist in any other disease. The others might be called common stigmata for the following reason. No doubt they present themselves among hystericals, and often in a high degree, but they do not exist solely among these patients, and they are to be found in other mental affections, in particular in the psychasthenic neuroses, which are closely akin to hysteria, though different from it. Let us dwell on the other stigmata proper, which are added to suggestion, and devote a few words to the common stigmata, which allow us to connect the neurosis we consider with the other disturbances of the mind. 1. Suggestion, let us not forget, is the development of an idea. It implies a positive phenomenon, the presence of an idea in the mind of the subject. We cannot connect with suggestion things that take place without the subject's being at all aware of them, without his realising them either consciously or subconsciously. Now, I do not believe that everything in hysteria is in relation with the thought of the subject. There are in these patients attitudes, dispositions that not only are not intentional, but that are in relation with no thought of the patients. I should like to put in the first rank of these phenomena a very singular disposition of mind, for which we have not even a very clear expression, namely a disposition to indifference, to abstraction, to quite exaggerated absent-mindedness. The fact is this. While paying attention to something, we turn from some other thing and cease to interest ourselves in other phenomena, which however reach our minds. While I am paying attention to what I am reading, I abstract myself from the noises in the street, though I still perceive them. This abstraction exists in hysteria in an astonishing degree. It was noticed early that it presents itself in regard to the sensations and to ideas. These patients appear to see but one thing at a time, and you become aware that they have no notion of another object, though it be very near the first. When they speak to one person, they forget that there are others in the room. They forget them so entirely that they would tell all their secrets before them with indifference. When they express some idea, you notice that their conviction is childish. It seems very strong because it rests on an astonishing ignorance. Objections, impossibilities, contradictions do not reach their minds in the least. The same limitation was observed in their movements from the first. They can perform but one action at a time. The first indication you perceive of a mental disturbance with many girls is their incapacity to do, in spite of their goodwill, more than one errand at a time. This fact may even be made in some sort experimental. Here is an experiment that I have described under many forms, and that Monsieur Pic, of Prague, has developed. You ask one of these patients to make a certain movement continually, for instance to make on the table with her right hand the movement of playing on the piano. It is agreed that she must not discontinue this little movement, whatever may happen. At the same time, you ask her to perform some other simple acts, to open her mouth, to shut her mouth, to recite numbers. You always remark that the first movement, the piano playing, stops as soon as the second begins, and that it only recommences at the end of this second movement. Yet the subject had made up her mind to continue this movement. She had this idea in her head, 
but it became impossible for her as soon as she tried to do something else it is this besides that gives a special appearance to all their accidents by the side of the positive phenomenon consisting in the development of the somnambulic idea in convulsions in persistent emotions there was a kind of lacuna a complete oblivion of the present situation an indifference to ridicule an insensibility to fatigue all of which we should not have had in their place one would think that these subjects when once ill forget all that is outside their present accident they do not remember having been in another state they do not conceive that one can be in another state hence that resignation that absence of effort which surprised us the exaggeration of this disposition will bring about the phenomenon of subconsciousness a great many things will exist outside the personal consciousness you will be able to make the patients walk and act unknown to themselves if the ideas you express do not attract their attention and if they remain in that domain of absent-mindedness it will result in mediumship as we saw before that the development of the ideas results in great somnambulisms can we say that this disposition to exaggerated absent-mindedness is a consequence of the preceding symptom of suggestion in fact it is not so for absent-mindedness is not suggested to these patients and often is not even noticed they have not the idea of this phenomenon the importance of which they do not suspect this singular absent-mindedness is mostly noticed by those around them or by themselves only very late several years after it has begun to develop itself on the other hand it is difficult to understand how suggestion which is precisely the development of an idea could explain this absent-mindedness which is indifference to an idea a tendency to suppression lastly suggestion itself appears to me to depend on that disposition and to be much oftener its effect than its cause it is precisely because the subjects have forgotten everything because they are no longer restrained by any sensation by any thought relative to the reality that surrounds them that they allow the ideas suggested to them to develop freely suggestion and absent-mindedness do not produce each other they are two parallel stigmata one of which cannot exist without the other this special absent-mindedness is a stigma peculiar to hysteria first of all you do not find it in the normal individual normal consciousness as philosophers say is always a fully illuminated point surrounded by a strong penumbra with the hysterical the penumbra is wanting this fact is brought into evidence by their quite peculiar visual field you do not find in any normal individual that odd vision which sees very clearly in one point and sees nothing around this point nor is this absent-mindedness to be met with in the same fashion in the other maladies of the mind individuals who are tired are inattentive but their minds are vaguely on the stretch no doubt they search into nothing but they have a vague notion of everything their sensibility is attenuated i grant but it is distributed over the whole of their body their vision is diminished but their visual field remains broad in a word the symptom i wish to describe to you is not inattention it is a suppression of all that is not looked at directly and i do not believe that it is to be found in this form in the other diseases of the mind so i make it a stigma proper to hysteria as suggestion itself a third phenomenon which besides depends on the preceding ones will make you understand these strange stigmata still better it is the phenomenon of transfers and equivalences i was seeking one day to cure a small localized accident to restore the motion of the right wrist with a patient whose fist was contractured you know that to succeed one must strongly direct the attention of the subject to the diseased organ which she has forgotten determine sensations in it move it passively in every way then when the motion has been a little restored induce the subject voluntarily to move this wrist this work is long and troublesome and has to be begun over and over again with hystericals when it has proceeded for some time the result seemed marvellous the right hand had opened and moved freely in every way the patient left the laboratory very happy and proud she re-entered it a few moments later in despair it was not worth while making such efforts she said presenting her left fist which was contracted exactly in the same way as her right fist had been a few minutes before i have cited this adventure because it struck me by the circumstances in which it occurred namely in a quite naive patient having no notion of the phenomenon and without the operator or herself having had the least idea of it beforehand you know that the result is not always like that during a certain period from 1875 to 1890 this phenomenon which is called transfer was very much sought after and often provoked artificially it was said to be brought about by the mechanical action of certain substances 
thus the magnet had preeminently the power of provoking transfers to cure a paralysis of the right side a big magnet was placed in the bed of the patient near her right side the paralysis was then found to disappear on that side and to become localized on the left side when the magnet was withdrawn the paralysis reappeared on the right side and after several oscillations of this kind it vanished other substances metals in particular sometimes the electric current had similar effects and transferred symmetrically from one side to the other the disturbances of sensibility as well as those of motion you remember that this phenomenon was very much studied by burke and dumont pallier who ascribed to it very odd laws some physicians said they had found the means to make the oscillations either slow or rapid to fix the disturbance on one side or the other etc others went even further they invented the change of the color sensations which were transformed into their complementary colors the patients after having seen red saw green after having seen yellow they saw violet they called this polarization and by means of the magnet tried to polarize also the feelings lastly for absurdity has no limits they tried to transfer a phenomenon from one subject to the other they placed two subjects back to back and thanks to the magnet the paralysis of the first passed into the second and after a few oscillations disappeared it became a convenient therapeutic process no doubt there are in all this many childish errors many of these observations are phenomena of suggestion and training they depend on the direction that is given to the attention of the subject this could not but be gradually recognized so that in science as in politics we saw a violent reaction the very notion of the phenomenon of transfer was suppressed and the fact that there is some little truth in it was overlooked in my opinion this passage of an accident from one side to the other is not necessarily the result of a suggestion it sometimes takes place unknown to the subject and to the operator and that very naturally it is a very particular application of a disposition which is very general with the hysterical and of which a thousand other applications are to be observed namely the disposition to equivalences hysteria in fact is a very singular malady the cure of which one never dares assert it is often easy through some psychological process or other to cause such or such a determinate accident to disappear besides these accidents often disappear of themselves in consequence of an emotion of some shake or even without reason but when an accident has disappeared especially when it has disappeared too quickly we should not at once cry out victory first of all the same accident is very likely to soon reappear then the following strange thing very frequently occurs another apparently quite different accident takes the place of the first a girl of twelve presented incoercible vomitings which had brought her to a very serious state of inanition thanks to certain excitations of the sensibility during a somnambulic state i succeeded in making her eat with more sensibility in regularizing her deglutitions and she no longer vomits this seems all right but from that moment this girl till then perfectly intelligent enters into a state of mental confusion and delirium and it becomes impossible to stop this delirium without the vomitings beginning again let us remark by the way that this singular alternation between disturbances of the stomach and deliriums is one of those that are oftenest observed i have noted down five fine examples of them but other identical facts are to be observed one patient has contractures in her limbs and when the contractures disappear mental disturbances another has hysterical coughing and alternating with it crises of sleep a man had a foot contractured in the position called varus he was cured through somewhat mysterious processes which frightened him he could now walk freely but he lost his voice for three months when his voice returned he had gastric accidents and abdominal contractures in another case the contractures of the trunk were healed and replaced by phenomena of amaurosis and so on indefinitely the accidents seem to be equivalent and to have the property of bearing on one side or the other provided they exist somewhere you would think that the subject can choose but cannot do without a disturbance localized in some place or another if you understand this law of equivalence as well you will see that the transfer from the right side to the left side is but a particular case of it it is even a particularly simple form of equivalence for the sensations of the symmetrical parts are very similar and can very easily be replaced by one another no doubt in many diseases of the mind we observe instability but this quite special form of instability which replaces one definite accident by another apparently quite different and that suddenly and clearly is again very characteristic i think it results from a general disposition of the hysterical mind 
which urges it to move in its entirety to one side while neglecting the rest of the body and mind then to move in its ensemble in another direction while forgetting the first this is connected with the preceding phenomenon of suggestion and constitutes the last of the stigmata peculiar to hysteria that i wish to point out to you two can we summarize these three stigmata suggestion absent-mindedness and alternation into a single general idea that will enable us to conceive the essential character which manifests itself in these mental troubles i proposed formally to characterize this mental state by an expression that is perhaps singular but that may be serviceable you will find it in my work on the psychological automatics in 1889 and in my book on the mental state of hystericals 1894 which was very well translated into english by mrs c roland corson in 1901 i proposed to summarize this somewhat peculiar mental state by the words retraction of the field of consciousness let us try to understand the meaning of this general expression the word consciousness which we use continually in studies on the mental state of our patients is an extremely vague word which means many different things when we use it in particular to designate the knowledge the subject has of himself of his sensations and acts it means a rather complicated psychological operation and not an elementary and irreducible operation as is generally believed if i say for instance i feel a pain i feel that i move my arm they take place in my mind rather complicated phenomena which we can analyze in the following manner in the first place there occurs somewhere in my brain on the occasion of an outer excitation a small fact both physiological and psychological which corresponds to a phenomenon of pain to an elementary sensation of motion the great physiologist herzen said that the brain may be compared to a spacious hall filled with innumerable small electric lamps from time to time certain little lamps kindle here and there this is what is designated by the isolated words sensation of pain sensation of vision sensation of motion in the scheme i have drawn figure 21 each separate little cross of the upper line designates one of those little phenomena v v prime v double prime when it is a question of the vision t t prime t double prime when it is a question of the sensations of touch and so on but the complete consciousness which is expressed by the words i see i feel a movement is not completely represented by this little elementary phenomenon it contains a new term the word i which designates something very complicated the question here is of the idea of personality of my whole person it is the union of present sensations different from the little sensation considered from all past impressions from the imagination of future phenomena it is the notion of my body of my capacities of my name of my social position of the part i play in the world it is an ensemble of moral political religious thoughts it is a world of ideas the most considerable perhaps that we can ever know for we are far from having made the tour of the domain of personality there are then in the i feel two things in presence of each other a small new psychological fact a little flame lighting up feel and an enormous mass of thoughts already constituted into a system i these two things mingle combine and to say i feel is to say that the already enormous personality has seized upon and absorbed that little new sensation which has just been produced if we dared and it is not altogether absurd we should say that the i is a living animal extremely voracious a sort of amoeba which sends out tentacles to seize and absorb a very small creature which has just been born at its side after having represented in the first line of our scheme of the elementary sensations or affective states or simply subconscious phenomena we represent secondly a reunion a synthesis of all these elementary phenomena which are combined among themselves and particularly combined with the vast and prior notion of personality it is only after this sort of assimilation that we can truly say i feel i formerly proposed to designate this new operation by the name of personal perception pp for it is indeed a perception that is to say a clearer and more complex consciousness the word personal will prevent confounding this operation with the outward perception of which we do not treat here and will recall to mind that its essential character is the addition of the notion of personality this figure is of course quite theoretical for it supposes an absurd thing namely that a man becomes at a given moment conscious of assimilates to his personality all the elementary sensations that are born in all his senses think what enormous masses of phenomena must spring up in us constantly from all the points of our body from the crowd of impressions made on our skin 
on our mucous membranes on the organs of our senses by all the outer and inner phenomena it is certain that a man never perceives them all there are always even in the most normal man a quantity of impressions that are born in one point of the skin reach to the brain determine a few reflexes awaken perhaps a few little states of elementary consciousness contribute no doubt to his general state of well-being or discomfort but are not clearly perceived by his personality a part only of these elementary sensations gives rise to complete and personal perception what is the number of those elementary phenomena that rise to complete consciousness of how many elementary sensations can we simultaneously have the complete consciousness this is what i proposed to call the problem of the extent of the field of consciousness by analogy as you see with the extent of the visual field this problem is not clearly resolved and psychologists have proposed very different figures the only essential and certain thing is that this extent of the field of consciousness varies very much with individuals and their states of mind an orchestral conductor hearing simultaneously all the instruments and following by reading or by memory the score of the opera unites in each of his states of consciousness an immense number of facts the individual who when asleep dreams and the patient during a crisis of ecstasy have on the contrary in their conscious thought a very limited number of facts i think there are on this point perpetual and very nice variations of our mental state if you understand this psychological conception well you can easily apply it to the preceding phenomenon that we have just noted with our hysterical patients their first moral stigma suggestion already shows us the isolation of the ideal it is because there is no reaction between the various impressions that each word each emotion each remembrance takes an inordinate development which we call suggestibility suggestion it is always said depends on the absence of control but control is nothing but the struggle the competition of the various psychological states united in the same consciousness if it is wanting it is because the mind is too narrow to contain several ideas opposing one another the second characteristic exaggerated absent-mindedness that abstraction bringing on all the blanks of consciousness is but another aspect of the same phenomenon our schema gives us the formula perfectly let us suppose figure 22 an individual who cannot see at a given moment more than three elementary sensations such as v v prime a he will leave all the rest in his subconsciousness at another moment he will be able to turn to t t prime v or to m v prime a at the first moment he will look at and listen to a person who speaks to him without troubling about the tactile sensations which continue to assail him at the second moment he will look at an object while touching it and appreciate the contact without having consciousness of the surrounding noises at the third moment he will write at dictation having the perception of the sound of the voice of the vision of the letters and of the muscular movements but forgetting and neglecting all the other elementary sensations as t t prime t double prime m prime m double prime v v double prime a prime a double prime this individual is absent-minded and this figure 22 is an attempt to schematize what is called normal absent-mindedness let us suppose that the field of consciousness becomes still more contracted the patient can no longer perceive more than two elementary sensations at once of necessity too he reserves this small share of perception for the sensations which seem to him whether right or wrong the most important the sensations of sight and hearing to have consciousness of what is seen or heard is of paramount necessity and he neglects to perceive the tactile and muscular sensations thinking he can do without them figure twenty three at the outset he might perhaps still turn to them and take them into his field of personal perception at least for a moment but the chance not presenting itself the bad psychological habit is slowly formed nothing is more serious more obstinate than these moral habits there is a crowd of maladies that are only psychological tics one day the patient for he has truly become one now is examined by the physician the latter pinches his left arm and asks him if he feels it and the patient to his great surprise is obliged to confess that he can no longer feel consciously the two long neglected sensations have escaped his personal perception he has become anaesthetic you may easily understand that the same notion of the contraction of the field of consciousness equally sums up the last phenomenon that of alternations it is because the field of consciousness remains contracted that you can never add one phenomenon on one side without taking one away from another side if you force the subject by attracting his attention to recover the sensibility of the left side he loses it on the right side if you obtain the total tactile sensibility 
the reduction of the visual field increases so much that the subject becomes momentarily blind a thing we have observed a number of times without having foreseen it if you wish to enlarge the visual field the tactile anesthesia will increase the feebleness of these patients thinking continues and they lose on one side what they seem to have regained on another i am therefore inclined to think that this notion of the retraction of the field of consciousness summarizes the preceding stigmata and we may say that their fundamental mental state is characterized by a special moral weakness consisting in the lack of power on the part of the feeble subject to gather to condense his psychological phenomena and assimilate them to his personality three formerly i stopped at this point my description of the hysterical mental state implying that all the other disturbances of their character could be connected with the preceding ones it no longer seems to me absolutely true today the hysteric malady is not absolutely isolated like other mental disturbances it is a special form which constitutes a part of a much more considerable group and which is more or less distinguished from the other diseases belonging to this group the patients we consider are first and above all neuropaths individuals whose central nervous system is weakened then they are hystericals when their enfeeblement takes a particular form i even affirm that they are more or less hysterical according as their malady takes a more or less decided turn in this determinate direction the result is that besides the properly hysterical stigmata they have general vague disturbances at once psychological and physiological which belong to all neuropathic individuals we cannot enter into the enumeration of these disturbances which besides would be more interesting in connection with other subjects but we must indicate them shortly under the title of common stigmata which you understand now i will point out to you in this connection certain feelings that play a role in the popular conception of hysteria these subjects feel weak dissatisfied with themselves their actions ideas feelings appear to them reduced covered with a kind of veil they are therefore perpetually tormented by a vague ennui which they cannot overcome ennui is the great stigma of all neuropaths you must not believe that it depends on surroundings the neuropath feels dull everywhere and always for no impression any longer brings about with him lively thoughts that make him pleased with himself these general sentiments of dissatisfaction these sentiments of incompleteness as i have christened them elsewhere almost always give to the patient a peculiar attitude or conduct either he is sunk in despondency and exhibits a doleful air or he seeks everywhere for something that can draw him out of this state now he has but very few means at his disposal to rouse himself to come out of such a painful state either he will use physical and moral processes of excitation walking jumping crying or he will appeal to other persons and will incessantly ask them to excite him to revive him through encouragements through praises and especially through devotion and love you see what will result from these needs these patients will be at the same time plaintive and agitated they will commit all kinds of eccentricities because eccentricity excites them and draws attention to them they must needs attract attention to themselves in order that people may take an interest in them speak to them praise and above all love them this need of attracting attention of being praised and loved is one of the things that have been most remarked in my opinion it has always been wrongly interpreted first of all it is a clinical error to ascribe this character to hysteria it sometimes exists in a very high degree with hystericals but it is by no means a stigma peculiar to this malady it exists as well in the psychasthenic the amorous manias of doubters and of patients laboring under obsessions their mania of jealousy their need of attracting attention to themselves are often much stronger and especially more enduring than with hystericals this remark has very often caused errors of diagnosis besides these feelings of incompleteness we might enumerate with our hystericals as with all neurasthenics whatsoever the innumerable lapses of all the mental functions we note in the intelligence a certain apparent vivacity associated with the fundamental state of laziness and especially of reverie these patients pay attention to nothing can bear no mental work hysteria like all neuroses begins among girls with the cessation of their studies and the complete incapacity of learning anything in fact this incapacity of attention brings with it as a consequence the absence of memory events are not fixed in the mind whereas old remembrances relating to periods previous to the malady are well preserved and are even reproduced with an exaggerated automatism recent events pass without leaving any trace it is a disturbance of the memory which i have described under the name of continuous amnesia it is frequent with hystericals but it is not proper to them 
and it must be considered only as a common stigma the same alterations are found in the feelings which are weakened the subjects who seem so emotional in reality feel nothing vividly they are indifferent to all new feelings and confine themselves to reproducing with an automatic exaggeration a few old feelings always the same their emotions which seem so violent are not just that is to say they are not en rapport with the event that seems to call them up you always hear the same cries the same declamations whether the question is of a surprise or of a happy or an unfortunate event lastly the disturbances of their will are well known the patients no longer will or rather they can no longer do anything they can no longer make up their minds to anything hesitate indefinitely before the least thing i think even that they can no longer make up their minds to sleep and in many cases the so serious insomnia of neuropaths is a phenomenon of abulia for they cannot even make up their minds whether they will remain awake or asleep of course it is especially new actions that will become difficult and for a long time the patients go on with old actions without being able to stop before they enter a state in which they no longer do anything this incapacity of beginning an act or an effort of attention and this incapacity of stopping it when it is once begun bring about the most serious disturbances most of the accidents might easily have been stopped at the outset we begin to dream because we wish to do so reverie is so pleasant we begin to eat sparingly in order to be thin to have a small waist and not to look like mamma we begin an annoyance get into tantrums but we were provoked to it all this as the patients will themselves confess might have been very easily stopped at the beginning but the act continues more and more automatically and the patient can no longer stop it herself it becomes a delirium an anorexia and an attack when i have begun something we heard a patient say i must go on with it i cannot stop i would break the windows kill myself i fall into an idea as down a precipice and the declivity is hard to climb again no doubt you will find all these phenomena of abulia with all neuropaths but that is not a reason for neglecting them with hystericals they constitute with them common stigmata which add themselves to their proper stigmata and besides often assume a particular aspect under the influence of the latter it is easy to summarize in a word these general disturbances of neuropaths it is a mental depression characterized by the disappearance of the higher functions of the mind with the preservation and often with an exaggeration of the lower functions it is a lowering of the mental level so we may say in short that hystericals present to us the following stigmata a depression a lowering of the mental level which takes the special form of a retraction of the field of consciousness. End of section 14section 15 of Major Symptoms of Hysteria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Major Symptoms of Hysteria by Pierre Janet. Lecture 15. General Definitions. Review of the Typical Symptoms of Hysteria. The Positive and Negative Phenomena in Somnambulism with Amnesia. In Agitations with Paralyses and Anesthesias. The General Idea of the Contraction of the Field of Consciousness and of the Lowering of the Mental Level. Definitions of Hysteria their congruency, psychological definitions, the need of precision in these definitions, definitions of hysteria as a disease by suggestion, discussion of these definitions, fixed ideas without relation to the medical form of the accident, the physiological and psychological laws unknown to the patient, the conditions of suggestion, hysteria as a form of mental depression characterized by the contraction of the field of personal consciousness and a tendency to the dissociation and emancipation of the system of ideas and functions that constitute personality the laws of localization the part played by the difficulty of the function by psychological automatism by the anterior weakening of the function by the localization of the emotion in these lectures on the great symptoms of hysteria i have tried to present a rapid picture not of all the symptoms of hysteria but of the essential ones in order that you might form a just idea of a singular malady of which everybody speaks and which but few physicians know well i have only presented to you the typical cases and forms around which it is easy for you to group the degraded forms and confused aspects which most diseases offer in practice 
we must try now to sum up these descriptions and to derive from them some general conception of the whole disease one allow me first to remind you in a few words of the essential pictures you should keep before your eyes in order to form a general idea of the hysterical disease we have studied somnambulism together i no longer say hysterical somnambulism for there is no more any somnambulism for us outside of hysteria we have studied it under its simple and typical form of monoidaic somnambulism then in its more complete forms of fugues of polyidaic somnambulisms of artificial somnambulisms you remember that we have always recognized in it the exaggerated development of an idea of a feeling of a psychological state in a word of a system of thoughts which takes place outside the memory and the normal consciousness this dissociation of a psychological system is manifested not only by the preceding development but also by amnesia bearing not only on the somnambulic period but even in remarkable cases on the whole of the idea and of the feeling when later we studied various accidents bearing on the movements of the limbs we recognized that small systems of movements and sometimes great systems rich and old constituting real functions develop themselves without control to an exaggerated degree and give rise to tics and careers of various kinds this lack of control is manifested through negative phenomena closely connected with the preceding ones paralyses and anesthesias which seem to play here the same role as the amnesias of somnambulism when we came to the sensorial functions we saw the same agitations under the forms of tics of pains and of hallucinations accompanied with certain losses of control which constitute various anesthesias bearing on the special senses as well as on the general sensibilities in connection with these anesthesias we remarked more clearly than we had done in connection with the preceding phenomena the real nature of these amnesias of these paralyses in a word of these disappearances of functions the function is far from being destroyed it continues to exist and often even develops to an exaggerated degree it is only suppressed from one very special standpoint it is no longer at the disposal of the will or the consciousness of the subject surprising as it is we recognized the same facts not only in the complex function of speech but even in the visceral functions the refusal to eat vomitings hysterical dyspneas are not diseases of the stomach or lungs they consist in a kind of emancipation of the cerebral and psychological function relative to these organs there is now an exaggeration independent of the function again and more often a disappearance from consciousness of these organic wants and of the acts that are connected with them finally in our last lectures we sought in the very character of these patients in the status of their minds for fundamental stigmata allowing us to recognize and understand the malady we succeeded in bringing into evidence on the one hand stigmata proper to hysteria suggestion absent-mindedness carried to unconsciousness alternation which we summarized in the general idea of retraction of the field of consciousness and on the other hand general stigmata the absence of attention the lack of feeling and of will which are connected with depression with the lowering of the mental level this is a clinical picture that must suffice us in practice if we remember these chief facts by comparing with them the complex and less clear cases that practice presents to us we shall succeed in appreciating the hysterical disease fairly justly while avoiding many prejudices and errors that are still very common nowadays unfortunately the human mind is not so easily content it is fond of dangers and quarrels and we feel the need of formulating concerning hysterical disease general conceptions interpretations definitions which are much more exposed to criticism and error it seems to me that it is in some way a medical fashion to give definitions on hysteria already in the old book of brachet in 1847 there were at the beginning about 50 formulas passed in review though lasseg said that hysteria could never be defined and that the attempt should not be made since that declaration everybody has tried to define it i have discussed in my little book on hysteria about ten definitions and i have been foolish enough to present a new one of course physicians have continued to define it and since that time ten others or so have been proposed we must obey the fashion by saying a few words about these definitions let us try to derive from them without attaching too great importance to the terms a general idea that suffices us in practice two i am wrong in laughing at the definitions of hysteria and observing to you their abundance which in these matters is not a proof of truth these definitions have evolved 
they have made visible progress and though they appear numerous nowadays they come so close to one another that they blend together do not forget that we are speaking of medicine and that this is rather a special domain less calm and serene than high mathematics you should not ask too much of the virtue of a physician or hope that he will confine himself to repeating the definition of a predecessor even if he does not cite his name what would be left for him he must needs change something in these definitions were it but a single word in order to appear to innovate which in medicine is indispensable i do not exaggerate in telling you that nowadays three-fourths of the definitions of hysteria are nearly identical thus i shall perhaps surprise you by telling you that there is no opposition between the definitions that gloriously entitle themselves physiological and those that modestly call themselves psychological no doubt there would be a great difference if these authors had seen really seen a lesion characteristic of the neurosis and if they had connected the evolution of the disease with this lesion never fear one can make nowadays a so-called physiological definition at smaller cost it is enough to take the most commonplace psychological definitions and replace their terms with words vaguely borrowed from the language of anatomy and the current physiological hypotheses instead of saying the function of language is separated from the personality one will proudly say the centre of speech has no longer any communication with the higher centres of association instead of saying the mental synthesis appears to be diminished one will say the higher centre of association is benumbed and the feat will be done i recommend to you in this connection to read the last book of monsieur jose ingenieros published at buenos aires in 1906 in the first chapter which i do not understand very well on account of my imperfect knowledge of spanish he shows that many of the definitions of modern physicians are equivalent and i am quite of his opinion so there is an ensemble of points on which all the authors agree and it is those which we shall have to bring into evidence charcot used to say that hysteria is an entirely psychic malady this opinion was discussed at his time there were still some remainders of the old uterine and genital theories there were still some attempts to connect hysteria with various nervous lesions dr bastian's book in england a very interesting book is very courageous he had the pretension to localize different hysterical accidents in different corners of the medulla of the bulb or of the lower centers of the encephalon that there is no truth in those old conceptions that hysteria will not be recognized later as resulting from some unknown disturbance of the secretion of a vascular gland or from some lesion of a nowadays badly defined nervous system i should not dare assert but one thing is certain namely that for twenty years everybody has departed from this view of the matter and that the psychological conception has the mastery i again observe to you that i consider the pretended physiological definitions as mere translations of the psychological ideas this point is almost agreed on by everyone but now difficulties begin of what kind of psychological disturbance is it a question we should not under pretense of psychology confusedly link hysteria with the vague group of mental diseases and the old nervosismos on this point the work of a distinguished physician dr dubois of berne interesting from other standpoints is in my opinion absolutely pernicious the psychological interpretation should not suppress what is good what is excellent in our ancestors works now the last century produced a monumental work namely clinical work with infinite patience and penetration all those great clinicians introduced order into a real chaos they ranged the diseases in groups they enabled us to recognize these groups improvements should consist in consolidating this edifice and not in throwing it down to say under pretense of psychology that a somnambulism is identical with any delirium that hysterical vomiting is a mere derangement to be confounded with manias of doubt or with melancholias or even perhaps with the tics of idiots is to go two hundred years back and it would be much better to suppress the psychological interpretation and to be content with the clinical description consequently in making hysteria a psychological affection we do not intend at all as m grasset seemed to believe to confound it with some sort of other or mental malady we even say that it is nowadays the most characteristic disturbance of all and that it is important to distinguish it well the first psychological notion that appears to me to result with the greatest clearness from all the contemporary works is a notion relative to the importance of ideas in certain hysterical accidents charcot studying the paralyses had shown that the disease is not produced by a real accident but by the idea of this accident it is not necessary that the carriage wheel should really have passed over the patient 
it is enough if he has the idea that the wheel passed over his legs this remark is easy to generalize there are such kinds of fixed ideas in somnambulisms and fugues the idea of one's mother's death the idea of visiting tropical countries etc there are such ideas in systematic contractures for instance when a patient seems to hold her feet stretched because she thinks herself on the cross there are such ideas in visceral disturbances and i have shown you the observation of a patient who died of hunger because she had the fixed idea of the turnips she had eaten when at school these remarks have been well made on every side it has also been established that with hystericals ideas have a greater importance and above all a greater bodily action than with the normal man they seem to penetrate more deeply into the organism and to bring about motor and visceral modifications it is a point which was again emphasized by messieurs mathieu and roux in a recent paper they devoted to hysterical vomiting what characterizes hystericals they said is less the fact of accepting some idea or other than the action exercised by this idea on their stomachs or intestines at the same time the studies on suggestion which have been very numerous have allowed clinicians to realize experimentally through the action of ideas many phenomena analogous to hysterical accidents so it may be said that the most common conceptions of hysteria turn on this character mebius in 1888 after charcot said we may consider as hysterical all morbid modifications of the body that are caused by representations strumpel in 1892 bernheim oppenheim and more recently babinski have repeated each of them of course with a slight change in the words quite similar definitions a phenomenon is hysterical said babinski when it can be produced through suggestion and cured through persuasion let us take no account of the end of the sentence the treatment and cure are delicate things much might be said on those cures through persuasion let us only retain the beginning hysteria is defined by suggestion it is absolutely the conception of charcot and mebius hysteria through fixed ideas and hysteria through representation this word suggestion which besides one takes care not to define is taken simply in the sense attached to it by all the preceding authors namely that of a too powerful idea acting on the body in an abnormal manner it is easy to remark here a unity of a great number of contemporary conceptions three i do not object very much to the preceding definitions if more precision were given to the meaning of the word suggestion these definitions would be agreed on by everybody besides these definitions bring back all the accidents of the neurosis to a symptom we have put in the first rank among the stigmata to the suggestibility so they are very scientific and useful it is one of the first results of all the psychological work that has been done on hysteria however i had already discussed them in 1894 and still think them insufficient as my arguments have been very little contradicted i will try to formulate them more clearly in the first place i believe that this conception of hysteria is more just in theory than in practice it rather summarizes a systematic interpretation than the clinical observation it is we who have repeated that the accidents seem to be brought about by ideas it is not quite exact that we always observe these ideas in a few cases and they are always the ones that are repeated the patient it is true has the idea that he is paralyzed i thought he says that my leg was crushed i had the idea that my leg no longer existed the consecutive paralysis with anaesthesia of the limb seems to be the exact translation of his idea but it is a singular exaggeration to apply this indifferently to all hysterical accidents and to say unreservedly with monsieur bernheim the hysterical realizes his accident just as he conceives it this is to come back to a kind of contemptuous accusation against the patient formerly the physician said to the patient you are paralyzed you have crises of sleep because you are willing to have these accidents now it is recognized that he is not willing to have them but it is still maintained that he thinks of them you have such or such a crisis with such or such an accident because you think of it i say that this is not true there are many hystericals who do not think of the accidents they have first of all with some patients the accidents develop insidiously unknown to them they become anaesthetic paralytic anorexic amorotic without in the least suspecting it clinical practice shows you this every day what shall we do then with the observations already cited by la Segue, in which it is the physician who reveals to the subject an anaesthesia or the blindness of one eye which he was not aware of in other cases it is incontestable that the accident develops with details 
with an evolution that the patient does not know whatever monsieur bernheim may say about it i do not admit at all that hystericals have at will paralyses with or without anesthesias i do not admit that these patients know what happens in their somnambulisms that they combine the disease beforehand if these patients have fixed ideas and i acknowledge that this is very frequent it should be well remarked that these fixed ideas have no relation to the medical form of their accident one has the fixed idea of her mother's death it is not at all the fixed idea of somnambulism and of its laws another has a fixed idea relative to the flight of his wife who robbed him it is not the fixed idea of dumbness much oftener than is believed the accident develops independently of the ideas of the subject whether the subject does not think of it or thinks of something else i should like to present in the second place an argument which is still weak but the importance of which will grow more and more it relates to the physiological and psychological laws of hysterical accidents laws of which we are ignorant and of which the subjects are ignorant like us when we see a crowd of accidents evolve according to these laws which we painfully describe we cannot say that they are due to auto-suggestion i remind you of the laws of somnambulisms which in my opinion are capital somnambulism is followed by an amnesia which bears not only on the abnormal period but often also on the idea itself that fills it and on all the feelings connected with it this amnesia disappears and all the apparently lost remembrances are restored when the subject comes back into the same somnambulism in the case of irene which i take as a type there is in the waking state an amnesia not only of the crisis but also of her mother's death of the three preceding months and of all that is connected with her affection for her mother and during the fits all these remembrances are perfect do the subjects who show us applications of these laws and in my opinion they are very numerous do these subjects know them have they the idea of having such an oblivion in connection with their somnambulism ah very unlikely they would much rather have the contrary idea that of being obsessed by their remembrance like the psychasthenics the more hysterical paralyses are studied the more laws of a similar kind will be discovered i have observed to you that the accidents bear on functions it is true that these functions oftenest appear to be identical with those which the vulgar have themselves recognized the function of alimentation the function of walk the function of the movements of the hand in this case you will tell me the paralysis might very well be brought about by an idea since the popular idea coincides with the very limits of the paralysis this is true in general simply because the popular ideas are true the great divisions of the functions correspond to the great divisions of the organs and the popular analysis has been correct that is all but there are some cases in which the popular analysis proves ignorance and in which hysterical paralysis analyzes the functions much better than good sense does why are the disturbances of speech accompanied with right-sided hemiplegy why are there cases of hemianopsia how is it that there are distinct paralyses of monocular vision and of binocular vision why are there disturbances of accommodation if you pass on to contractures do you really believe that the patient has the idea of rigidity without fatigue without increase of temperature that he has the idea of that modification of the reactions of that slowness of the muscular shake i am convinced for my part that hysterical contracture has its own laws quite peculiar to it presenting us as i told you a degradation of the contraction of the striated muscles all this is outside of the thought of the subject as i told you at the beginning it will be later a matter of astonishment that physicians should have attributed to the caprice of the subject all the psychological and physiological laws that will be discovered in these various accidents lastly i insist on a third argument these definitions have a meaning only on condition that the words fixed idea and suggestion are used in a particular sense this sense should be that with hystericals ideas do not conduct themselves as with everybody it is of no use for me to represent to myself that i am asleep i do not therefore sleep all these authors imply tacitly that these ideas act in a special manner on the mind and organism i answer that it is this special action that is the essential point it is this action that constitutes hysteria and you have not the right to make a definition in which you tacitly imply what is essential begin by defining what you call suggestion and afterwards you may say if you choose and if it is true that hysteria is a disease due to suggestion but to define suggestion you will be obliged to introduce into your definition certain new notions which are precisely those i asked for four 
you will be obliged to recognize that these ideas present themselves in special conditions that they develop out of measure because they meet with no counterpoise in the mind because they are isolated owing to a strange absent-mindedness of the subject in a word you will recognize the other stigmata absent-mindedness and the retraction of the field of consciousness when you have once admitted this retraction of the field of consciousness as one of the conditions of suggestion itself why should you maintain that it can produce nothing but suggestions why should you not admit that this disease of the mind may be manifested by something else if this retraction has given too much power to certain ideas does it not produce on the other hand some blanks can it not isolate and emancipate one function and suppress another from consciousness we then arrive at another group of definitions in which i range mine they are definitions in my opinion more profound into which enter the phenomena of dissociation of consciousness such as is observed in all hysterical disturbances suggestion itself is but a case of this dissociation of consciousness there are many others beside the one in somnambulisms in automatic words in emotional attacks in all the functional paralyses many authors gurney myers laurent breuer and freud benedict oppenheim jolly pick morton prince have thought like me that a place should be made for the disposition to somnambulism was not the somnambulic attack for us the type of hysterical accidents in 1889 the disposition to this dissociation and at the same time the formation of states of consciousness which we propose to collect under the name of hypnoid states constitute the fundamental phenomenon of this neurosis said messieurs breuer and freud of vienna in 1893 the point which seems to me to be the most delicate in this definition is to indicate to what depth this dissociation reaches in reality we might say that the dementias themselves are dissociations of thought and of the motor functions we must remember that in hysteria the functions do not dissolve entirely that they continue to subsist emancipated with their systematization what is dissolved is personality the system of grouping of the different functions around the same personality I maintain to this day that if hysteria is a mental malady it is not a mental malady like any other impairing the social sentiments or destroying the constitution of ideas it is a malady of the personal synthesis and i will take up again very slightly modified the formula i have already presented hysteria is a form of mental depression characterized by the retraction of the field of personal consciousness and a tendency to the dissociation and emancipation of the systems of ideas and functions that constitute personality five let us leave two general discussions and come back to a more clinical conception of things the most important problem is not for me to understand what hysteria in general is but to account for the practical evolution of the accidents with such or such a person the difficulty we meet with then is a difficulty of localization how is it that with one person the hysteria bears on the arm with another on the stomach and that with a third it only reaches a system of ideas which it turns into a somnambulism it is on this search for an interpretation proper to each subject that one should dwell to my mind much more than on general quarrels of definition the starting point of hysteria is the same as that of most great neuroses it is a depression an exhaustion of the higher functions of the encephalon all the psychological operations do not present as i repeat the same difficulty there are some operations that are easy for all kinds of reasons first because they are simple and only require the union of a small number of elements second because they are old because their systematization was the work of our ancestors and is inscribed in strongly constituted organs there are some other functions that are difficult because on the one hand they are very complex because they necessitate the systematization of an infinite number of elements and because on the other hand they are very new and require a present synthesis not yet inscribed in the organism now our nervous strength which we do not know at all presents oscillations when it is high we easily accomplish the operations of the second group we have an extended consciousness we turn back from no new study or action but there are many circumstances in which this nervous tension is lowered especially with those hereditarily disposed there are some physiological periods puberty for instance at which the vital forces seem to be busy elsewhere and to leave no great resource to the brain there are diseases that through a thousand mechanisms through local lesions through intoxication through microbian infection lower our nervous tension even in normal functioning physical or intellectual fatigue is enough to produce momentarily the same result lastly 
the fact is more difficult to understand but incontestable emotion is characterized by this lowering of the nervous strength very likely in emotion there is a great expense of nervous strength necessitated by the new problem suddenly set and the emotional disturbance must come close to that of fatigue however it may be our patients have been exhausted through one of the preceding causes if hereditarily predisposed they are enfeebled by puberty or they succumb to intoxication fatigue or emotion the diminution the lowering of the nervous tension may bring about a general lowering of all the functions and especially of the highest this is what takes place in the psychasthenic neuroses in which the localization on a special point exists in a rather slight degree with hystericals in consequence of particular dispositions the lowering of the nervous strength produces in some manner a superficial retraction there is as it were an autonomy consciousness which is no longer able to perform two complex operations gives up some of them there is it is true a general enfeeblement which manifests itself through the common stigmata but there is above all a localization of the mental insufficiency on such or such particular function so we find again in hysteria the problem of localization which is of great importance in this disease no doubt in a certain number of cases the localization is effected through suggestion an idea suggested from without attracts the thinking in one direction or another and brings about besides according to laws the subject does not know such or such automatic functioning and such or such a loss of function this is only a particular case the localization may also be effected through a process akin to suggestion but which is not identical with it according to the laws of psychological automatism i have often drawn your attention to those individuals who having had an accident in certain circumstances and having been cured always recommence the same accident each time they experience an emotion though it has no relation with the first the man who was wounded by a railroad engine has a delirium in which he sees an engine coming towards him this is quite simple eleven years afterwards he sees his wife die and he recommences the engine delirium another has the tick of blowing through one of his nostrils because he had a scab in his nose in consequence of a bleeding at the nose he recovers from his tick but he recommences it now because he loses his fortune because his child is ill etc third law the dissociation simply bears on a function that for some reason or other has remained weak and disturbed many of our patients become dumb after an emotion but they were formerly inclined to stammer their speech was quite insufficient a girl's right leg becomes paralyzed the reason is that in her childhood her right leg was affected with rachitis in the case of another girl the paralysis of a leg is due to the fact that in her childhood the leg was affected with a white tumor and remained long in bandage this remark relates specially to the very numerous cases of associated hysteria a disease of any kind bearing on viscera often an organic lesion of the medulla or of the brain enfeebles or disturbs some function and it is on this function that the hysteric emancipation is localized so in certain cases hysteria makes conspicuous some light symptoms of organic diseases of the nervous system quite at their beginning by exaggerating them beyond all measure the fact for instance was frequently observed in the cases of tibetic vomiting associated with hysteric vomiting fourth law the function that disappears is the most complicated and the most difficult for the subject this law applies chiefly to professional and social paralyses finally fifth law we remark a very curious fact which we recognize without always being able to account for it the dissociation bears on the function that was in full activity at the moment of a great emotion there are here some physiological laws that cause the chief disturbance to bear on this function that make it probably through an association of ideas through an evocation of the emotion the most difficult for the subject it is the study of these laws it is the search for these conditions that constitute the important part of the study of hysteria leave the discussions of general definitions they are premature discussions which bear on purely verbal differences retain from these lessons the importance that attaches to the study of the psychological functions the necessity of analyzing in each particular case the mental state of the patient if these lectures have inspired you with some interest for this kind of studies if they can contribute to develop in your beautiful country the researches of pathological psychology beside the researches of experimental psychology so brilliantly represented i think you will not have lost too much time in trying to understand a barbarous language for my part i deeply feel your kind attention and reception and i am proud of having had for a few days the honor of teaching you 
and of being the colleague of the masters of harvard university end of section fifteen end of the major symptoms of hysteria by pierre janet